Tonight's Candidate Forum is brought to you by the Montgomery College Alumni Association, the Montgomery County Civic Federation, the League of Women Voters of Montgomery County, and the Organization of Chinese Americans, Greater DC Chapter. From the Robert E. Perilla Performing Arts Center on the Rockville campus of Montgomery College, MCTV presents an election 2010 candidate forum featuring Montgomery County Council at Large Democratic primary candidates. Moderated by Lon Anderson of AAA Mid-Atlantic and the Montgomery College Alumni and Foundation Boards. Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for being here. I'm Lon Anderson, your moderator tonight. Before we get started, I want to acknowledge our sponsoring organizations, and I'd ask those uh, to stand, please. The League of Women Voters, Diane Habino, President and our timekeeper tonight. The Montgomery County Civic Federation, represented by Dan Wilhelm. The Organization of Chinese, American, of Chinese Americans, the Greater D.C. Chapter, Vivian Yao, Vice President at Large. And the Montgomery College Alumni Association, represented by many here, including myself. If there are any other elected officials, by the way, in the audience right now, I'd uh, ask you to stand up. I'd ask you to stand up so you can be recognized. All right. Okay. <laughs> And now I'd like to introduce Dr. Judy Ackerman, Vice President and Provost of the Rockville campus uh, of Montgomery College, our campus host this evening. Judy. Thank you, Lon. It's my pleasure to welcome you to our Rockville campus of Montgomery College for this uh, County Council at Large Candidates Forum. Almost everyone has an opinion about politics. The comedian Julius Henry Marx, better known as Groucho Marx, once said, Politics is the art of looking for trouble, finding it everywhere, diagnosing it incorrectly, and applying the wrong remedies. One thing is certain, Groucho never met the citizens of Montgomery County who run for elective office. Our candidates care about the quality of life in our county and want to make it a better place. Here at Montgomery College, we're very pleased that we can serve as a gathering place for citizens to become better informed about candidates for public office and their positions on the issues. Forums such as this one encourage all of us to get involved. Maybe tonight someone in the audience will be inspired to work on behalf of a candidate or to run for office in a future election. Montgomery College classes begin a week from today on August 30th. At that time, we expect to welcome to this campus about 17,000 credit students, along with thousands who will enroll in non-credit courses through workforce development and continuing education. Over the years, the college has been fortunate to enjoy the support and confidence of the county council. Council members have worked with us to ensure that the citizens of our county have quality, affordable educational opportunities close to home. Here at Rockville, I have good thoughts about our county council and elected officials every day as I gaze out at the new science center that their support has made possible. <laughs> There's one person in the audience this evening that it gives me the greatest pleasure to introduce. The new president of Montgomery College has been very busy since her arrival at the beginning of the month in getting to know the college community and the greater community. Please welcome Dr. Darian Pollard. <laughs> Candidates, thank you for throwing your hats in the ring to serve our county. Public service is very important work. Thank you, Lon Anderson, for serving as moderator this evening, and thank all of you for joining us. Dr. Ackerman, thank you so much. And welcome, President Pollard. 
My objective as the moderator this evening is to provide our audience, uh, both those here and those joining us by cable, uh, with fair, fast-paced, interesting, and informative program that helps our audience get to know you, uh, the candidates, uh, a little better to enable our county's voters to make informed decisions at the polls on September 14th. And also remember, early voting starts September, uh, September 3. So uh, now the ground rules. First, everyone, please turn off your cell phones and other distracting electronic devices. Much appreciated. Uh, each candidate will have one minute for opening statements. In response, each prepared question, and that be about the first three questions, each candidate will have about one minute. In response to the audience questions, each candidate uh, will have 30 seconds to answer. In some instances, we may allow a rebuttal, but that must be kept to 30 seconds. And please, because of the need to allow everyone to have fair participation, uh, adhere to the times. Rebuttals will not be automatic, but will be at the discretion of the moderator. By the way, that's me, not the candidates. Uh, closing statements will be held uh, to 90 seconds each. Our timekeeper tonight is Diane Hibbeno, president of the League of Women Voters. She runs a tight ship. She's sitting right there, waving a stop sign. And uh, please adhere to our time limits as a courtesy to all. Please remember, the show is being televised live and will also be rebroadcast. So adherence to our time limits, uh, candidates, is absolutely critical. Uh, the rebroadcast schedule is listed on the back of your programs. Um, we will have time uh, reminder cards displayed as the time gets short. To get us started, I will offer a few questions. Meanwhile, we're also distributing index cards and are now seeking questions from the audience. Uh, so if you have questions uh, that you would like to ask, Please write them out, pass them to the aisles, and our ushers will deliver them to our screeners. Um, Susan, Susan Madden, Chief Government Relations Officer, and Linda Silversmith, Chairman of the National Resources Committee of the League, uh, will uh, go through the submitted questions and uh, make the selections. Now, I would like to introduce our participating candidates, remembering that this forum only includes candidates participating in the Democratic primary for the four at-large county council seats. In alphabetical order, our candidates are Jane DeWinner, Mark Elrich, Fred Evans, Nancy Foreen, George Leventhal, Raj Nirian, Hans Riemer, Dutchie Trachtenberg, Becky Wagner. Thank you all so much for being here tonight. Now to our first question. And I think we'll start in alphabetical order, so, the, so this will go to Jane to winner first. Okay. Montgomery College has been very fortunate to enjoy the strong financial support of our county council members and the county executive. But even so, the college is struggling financially as more students turn to it as a low-cost, high-quality alternative in this recession. Yet the college, with enrollment growing, has had to absorb cuts from both the state and the county, forcing MC to raise tuition, among other things. Last year, nearly 3,000, that's 3,000 students, were not able to attend this college because there were no funds to assist them. How might you specifically address this difficult question? Jane DeWinner, if you would start. Thank you. Um, well, Montgomery College certainly is a jewel and it's an important piece in our efforts to educate uh, all of the members of our community, all of the youth, and as well as prepare our workforce for you know, continuing education programs. Uh, I, I think that there's a number of things. I mean, we've had difficult budget cuts all across the county, so the college is not excluded from that. I think that we need to focus on efforts to increase revenues, increase our tax base across the board so that we can afford to do these, uh, continue our support for Montgomery College. And I think it's important to remember that uh, spending money on the college is an investment <clears throat> and that we need to be prepared to make that investment. Uh, I also I know that there are some programs that are able to leverage funding from the state. There's a new program for offering a 
a certification program for immigrants who come with foreign qualifications and, and who need to be certified in the United States. And I think that bringing in those kinds of programs where there's money from outside sources is one way. Um, I also think that this is not a county measure. Excuse but, me. Sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm going to have to cut you. Time. I'm going to have to cut you there. Now, before we go to, to Mark, who would be next, I made a mistake. I didn't give you an opportunity for opening statements. I apologize. You're each due 90 seconds to open. I'd like to start the other end. And why don't we start with Becky Wagner, opening statements. Good evening. I'm not suffering the tyranny of the alphabet. I get to go first. My name is Becky Wagner. I'm asking for your vote on September 14th. I'm a progressive Democrat running at large for county council. I've lived in Montgomery County for 40 years. <clears throat> During that 40 years, my sons and my husband and I have thrived, and I'm running because I want the opportunity for everyone else in this county and those who come to this county to have those same opportunities to thrive that my family did. I started the first shelter for homeless women 30 years ago, Rainbow Place. I see people in this room that I know have already volunteered there, and so I thank you for your service. I worked for Senator Paul Sarbanes for six and a half years and had that responsibility of supporting Prince George's, Montgomery, and Howard County. It was there that I really became to know Montgomery College because we know that it's a collection of federal and state and county dollars that really give an institution the opportunity to, to become what it could be. The last 11 years, I've served as the executive director of Interfaith Works, an interfaith coalition of 165 congregations working to meet the needs, needs of the low-income community. Last year, 35,000 men, women, and children were helped through that work. I'm running for county council because I believe we can do better. And I believe that at a time when priorities call for critical business experience, I'm bringing that to the table. I know how to make a budget, and I know how to keep a budget, and I know that I have to accomplish my mission within that budget. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dutchie Trachtenberg, please. Good evening. I'm Dutchie Trachtenberg, and I'm running for re-election. I think many of you know when I ran four years ago and I was elected, I went to the council with some skills, some skills as a clinician in the community, but also some, some experiences as an advocate, specifically around women's issues and also mental health issues. And that, of course, as many of you know, was born out of a personal experience with my eldest child who's schizophrenic. So I've worked hard on the HHS committee with my colleague, Council Member Leventhal. I was the leading force behind the Family Justice Center, a clearinghouse facility for domestic violence victims that is in its first year has served 1,700 families from over 100 countries. But I've also chaired the Finance Committee, which is where all the action is, and I'm sure you know that too. We've made a lot of hard choices, certainly this budget season, but that work for me started almost four years ago when I was elected to the council and chosen to chair that committee. In recent months, we've actually worked on a six-year fiscal plan, which we passed unanimously, and also put forward a new and improved reserve fund policy. So I believe I have the experience and the poise to continue to provide leadership, but more importantly, the right direction in these difficult fiscal times. I look forward to your questions this evening, and thank you for having us. Thank you. Hans Riemer. Good evening, everyone. My name is Hans Riemer. I'm running for the Montgomery County Council at large. I ask for your support. Uh, I live near Montgomery College's Rockville, uh, Silver Spring, Tacoma campus. Uh, my wife, Angela, and I have a three-year-old son and another one due in January. Uh, last few years, I've worked for AARP, where I focus on retirement policy and community engagement. And I was a senior staffer for the Obama campaign. And I helped organize the coalition that stopped Bush uh, from privatizing Social Security. My work here in the county is focused on public transportation issues like protecting metro funding and ride-on buses and building the Purple Line, the Quarter Cities Transit Way. I'm running for the council because I want to make sure that Montgomery County continues to be a great place for families in every generation. I think that means protecting our schools and our parks, libraries, public safety. Uh, I want to protect our neighborhoods and in our environment. I think that means changing the way that we approach development issues to prioritize public transportation, walking, and biking as more central to our strategy. I've been endorsed by the Washington Post, uh, the county's teachers, the Sierra Club, 
Progressive Maryland Council Members Valerie Irvin and Nancy Navarro, uh, Council Member Roger Berliner. Uh, last week, Roger Berliner endorsed me. He said, we need Hans's positive spirit and his positive energy on the council. I ask for your support uh, to continue the good progress we're making, uh, but make it better. Thank you. Thank you. Raj Narayanan, please. My name is Raj Narayanan, and I'm the president of University Towers Condominium, where I have saved $400,000 in our annual operating budget by re-engineering the processes that we do over there. I have a PhD in economics, and I have been a business school faculty. On the social side, over the last 12 years, I have been a volunteer yoga teacher, and I'm the executive director over the last four years of Life and Yoga Foundation. I would uh, like to bring all the uh, re-engineering and the business management side to reduce the costs for the uh, county at this time. The needs of the time at this time for the county is cost management without reducing services, and that I think I will be able to bring for you. I would like to request your vote. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, George Leventhal, please. Hello. I'm George Leventhal, running for my third term on the county council. I'm a husband and a father. I have two children in Montgomery County Public Schools. Sarai and I have been married for 20 years. I've lived in Montgomery County for 37 years, and for the last eight, I've been one of your at-large county council members, chairing the Health and Human Services Committee, which is responsible for programs that benefit the poor, the sick, the elderly, the homeless, the mentally ill, the disabled, and abused and abandoned children. I get to help people every day, and there's great satisfaction in knowing that the work I've done, along with my colleagues, has made such a great difference in the lives of people like the 26,000 people this year who will receive health care through the Montgomery CARES program that I initiated in 2005, even though they don't have health insurance. I do want to take just a few seconds to acknowledge some of my good friends and colleagues, elected officials who are here. Council Vice President Valerie Irvin is here, school board member Shirley Brandman, and two of our members of the House of Delegates, both of whom are running for other office, my good friend Delegate Craig Rice running for County Council and Delegate Herman Taylor, my, my other good friend running for Congress. Let me just say that this council has had to make some very difficult choices. What you'll hear tonight are suggestions from those who are not in office that if they had been in office, the choices would have been easier and they would have made them better. In fact, the council balanced the budget. We worked together. We are striving towards a bright future for Montgomery County, and I hope you'll give me a chance to continue working for you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Nancy Florine. Thank you. Uh, I'm Nancy Florine. I'm finishing my second term on the Montgomery County, County Council, and this year I've served as its County Council President, and I ask for your vote at the, in the Democratic primary on September 14th. A couple weeks ago, the Washington Post endorsed me. They said I was seasoned and pragmatic. Um, I hope that's what you look for in a member of the county council. Over about the past 30 years, I've been involved in community issues from a, being a PTA president down at East Silver Spring Elementary School, a community advocate and attorney representing uh, many communities all over Montgomery County, a uh, member of the county planning board, uh, mayor of the town of Garrett Park, but the most important years have been the last eight serving on the county council. What I've learned from listening to you all, listening hard, doing my homework, and trying to forge solutions is that there aren't any easy answers, uh, but this is a great time for Montgomery County to move forward. I, I'm committed to a sustainable fiscal future, to developing an environment where we can have good economic and educational opportunity for everyone, and preserving our quality of life. And I ask for your vote on September 14th. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Fred Evans, please. Good evening. It's good to be back at Montgomery College. Uh, I came to Montgomery County 40 years ago to begin my teaching and education career at Thomas S. Wooten High School. And I have been here ever since, and very proudly so. I recently, well recently, 10 years ago, retired from the Montgomery County Public Schools where my last uh, assignment was the principal of Gaithersburg High School. I have to make a little pitch for Montgomery College because uh, 
I work very closely with the college and am currently the chair of the nominating committee for uh, to nominate members of the Board of Trustees. I hold that title, have that title for the past three years. Very committed to this, this college and, and what it does. And in fact, uh, one of its alum, alumna is in the audience, my wife Trish, who went here and uh, advocated very hard for them, as well as I have two daughters in the school system, Olivia and, and Grace, and then another daughter who's also in the school system, who's an assistant principal at Rockville High School. So I, uh, I think I understand at least the school part of things. What I want everyone to know is that it is time to ask very, very tough questions about how we got into the fix we're in and what we're going to do about it in an effective way. And I am prepared to do that. I have had uh, a lot of effort in constituent services, listening to people in my role as a principal and a community activist, and I'll get into some of that in my conclusion about where I've been and where I expect this county to go in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Mark Elrich. Hi, I'm Mark Elrich. I'm finishing my first term on the County Council, and I'm asking for your support on September 14th in the Democratic primary. I'm a county resident since 1960. I'm a graduate of Montgomery County Public Schools, and my children went to school here. I taught for 17 years at Rolling Terrace Elementary School in Silver Spring, served for 19 years on the City Council of Tacoma Park, I think most of you in the audience, and I know a lot of you in the audience, know me as a civic activist. I've been involved around environmental activism, I was involved on education activism, and I've been involved working with civic groups throughout the county on local issues as well as master plans and development issues before I was on the county council. And so I bring a pretty broad range of experience um, to my role on the council. When I came there, my focus was trying to make sense of the county's growth policy and trying to make sure that as we grew, we finally tied infrastructure to the growth policy and that we raised enough money from development to actually pay for the infrastructure as opposed to what had occurred in the previous 12 years. Um, but the reality in, in the county changed very rapidly when the global economy melted down. And I'm, I wanted to say briefly, when I, one of the first things I did as a member of the um, Public Safety Committee, where I'm the lead on youth, was I asked about county youth programs, and I wanted to know what the county does, where it does it, who it serves, why it serves them, what percentage of the target population do you reach, what are your goals, how do you know if you succeed, and what do you do if you don't? Those are the kinds of questions I've asked about everything I do, and I look forward to your questions again tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and Jane DeWinter. Good evening. My name is Jane DeWinter, and I'm an at-large candidate for Montgomery County Council. I am a longtime community leader, having served as past president of the Montgomery County Council of PTAs. I currently serve on the county's Commission on Children and Youth. I'm the parent of four children educated in our public schools, and I hold a PhD in economics. There's no sugarcoating it. Our county is facing tough times. We need to be able to set priorities. We need clear decision making. We need people who understand the changing county and, and how to respond to these changes while looking ahead and planning for the future and connecting what's going on with the county with a larger economy and with the larger trends that are out there. When I first decided to run for the county council, I felt that with my years of experience as an economist and as a community leader in our schools, that I offered a unique set of skills to help our county make the best decisions it could to best serve the people in our community. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and now I want to return to the, the first question that we had asked, as you remember. Um, the, the, basically, the question was that college enrollment at Montgomery College has been growing, uh, and yet we've had to absorb cuts and raise tuition, among other things, and that last year 3,000 students were unable to attend because there were no funds to assist them. So uh, let me kick that to uh, Mr. Elrich. I've been a strong supporter of, of the college um, since I was elected, and I think that it, it plays an absolutely critical role um, in the lives of many people in the county because the number of seats at the University of Maryland are increasingly competitive and actually dwindling in, dwindling in availability given the number of people who want to go to college. So if you don't have a strong community college system like we have here, then there's not a place for, for a lot of our youth to go. The, the problem that we're dealing with is it's not just the cuts and increased demands that we're 
visit on the school system, but we have increased demands for people who need housing assistance, people who need medical care assistance. Um, the number of demands and pressures on the county have only grown in these difficult economic times. I don't believe we're going to be saved by the state, and I don't believe we're going to be saved by the federal government. And anybody who tells you you're going to grow a ton of revenue in the next year is unrealistic. We need to look at our own house. We need to be serious about reorganizing the county government. We need to look for every savings we can get out of the things we do, because that is the one pot of money we control and the one place we can go to work immediately. Thank you so much. Mr. Evans. I'm a gigantic advocate of Montgomery College, had a lot of partnership programs with them through my years of working in the school system, and it is a flagship community college. I think we all know that. I have to agree with Mr. Elrich on, on this one, that we need to look at all of our agencies and where we spend money in a collaborative way so that all the parties are sitting down and talking about where we can make reasonable cuts, because in the next couple of years, that's going to have to happen. What I don't want to see is the arguments that I have seen going back and forth between the agencies where you have a school board who threatens to sue, not sue, but who threatened to sue the county council because of the lack of funding. That won't work. I have been amazed in my walking around the county and talking to people how little community members know about the actions of the county council, and I want to improve on that. Thank you. Thank you. Nancy Florine. Thank you. I'm absolutely committed to doing all I can to fund education in Montgomery County, both through MCPS and through the college. Um, I've been doing that since I've been on the council. This was a tough year and a year of shared sacrifice. I will point out, as I recall, uh, the college made out better than anybody else. Um, it's still not enough, I know. Uh, I think the challenge is that it was a year of, sh of shared sacrifice and we'll continue that way. Um, our six year fiscal plan shows already that there will be no additional revenues available for uh, agency spending next year. And those conversations are continuing. So I think it's good for us to know in advance what the resources look like. Uh, of course, uh, the stock market could go way up again, uh, but I'm not so optimistic about that right now. The fact of the matter is what's important is for us to work together, uh, look to how we can share efficiencies, and that work is going on now as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Leventhal, please. I want to tell you that the budget that the County Council passed this year at the end of May was better, fairer, and more humane than the budget that we received in March from the County Executive. And one of the agencies that did the best was Montgomery College under Council President Nancy Florine's leadership and with Councilmember Elrich and Councilmember Trachtenberg's support and with great leadership by the chair of our Education Committee, Valerie Irvin, we added $4 million above the recommendation of the county executive so that we did not have to turn away so many students who seek opportunities for workforce training, lifelong learning. Montgomery College serves every age group. Montgomery College is not teenagers. Montgomery College is every age group and every nationality. We understand that Montgomery, Co Montgomery College is the door to opportunity for participation in the vibrant and successful economy that we want for Montgomery County. We balance the budget this year. We will balance the budget next year. We will make difficult decisions, but we will always make education our first priority, and we will always support Montgomery College. Thank you. Mr. Narayanan. Having been outside the government, I cannot get into specifics, but generally, having worked with many large companies and organizations in the profit and nonprofit area, I am fairly convinced any place which has been doing business as usual has more than adequate ability to cut costs and not cut services. And I believe that if we free up funds from the government, they'll be more available for Montgomery College. And if we find ways to do things differently at Montgomery College, perhaps the pressure may be relieved for quality of the programs. I would like to say that having earned a PhD, one of the things that you learn is how much you know about one subject and how little you know about so many other things. And in that process, you learn the respect, uh, you learn to respect the worth of education, and I would definitely support Montgomery College. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Reamer. Well, I think Montgomery College is critically important to our future here in the county. 
Uh, one dimension of that is we're trying to create these science-based jobs, these jobs in the industries of the future. And how are we going to be sure that the people who live here today are going to be able to get those jobs? Montgomery College is one of the most important avenues for workforce development. We've got to do more there. But looking today, we can't pay to allow all the students who want to go to this school to attend. Um, and I think you have to look back at years past, during the height of the bubble, during the good years, when the budget was going up 10 to 15 percent a year. It wasn't enough. Taxes even had to go up when the budget was going up 10 to 15 percent a year. Now here we are today in a hole that uh, we are having a very difficult time digging out. Uh, the solution in my mind is everything has to be on the table. Uh, I agree education is our first priority, uh, but we have to make sure that every line item in all the budgets can be evaluated, can be explored for savings. We don't want to cut bad things while there's good things. Uh, we don't want to cut good things while there's still bad things available for cuts. Thank you so much. Uh, Dutchie Trackenberg, please. Well, I think we'd all agree this evening that education is not a luxury, that it's a necessity for every child, and really every adult as well. And that's what Montgomery College does. It offers opportunities to kids that have grown up in this community, but it really offers opportunities to adults uh, to go into new careers. Certainly that's a, an important factor in today's economy. But it also offers opportunities to adults maybe not looking to retool, but really looking to better their lives and their children's. So we know that at the council, as described by my colleagues, there was a uh, extraordinary commitment made this budget season to support the college, and I'm sure that will continue. We can look at restructuring um, service delivery here in the county. In fact, we have a restructuring committee that was named by both the council and the executive, who I met with just a few weeks ago. So there are opportunities, no doubt, for consolidation efforts and the like. But the issue here really is working with the state more aggressively, because in my opinion, we don't have our fair share of funding for secondary education, for college, co community college education. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Wagner. So we're trying to figure out how to get blood out of a turnip. <laughs> We've been told there's no money at the county, we know there's no money at the state, and we can't print money like the federal government. Everyone here tonight values Montgomery College and knows a child, a relative, a sister, a brother who is successful in their life because of their opportunity. It's a first opportunity or it's a do-over here at Montgomery College, but it is all of that. And if it is that valuable, then it has to become a priority in our budget. A budget is a moral document. The frustration for me is that for four years, we, our council accepted revenue projections that were unsustainable. They accepted those projections and deferred pension payments, accepted those projections and failed to meet the MOE. And now we're gonna open up contracts and who is proud of making an agreement and having to open up a contract? In the truth, we have to simultaneously figure out how to grow jobs. Thank you so much. Now I'd like to go to our, uh, our second prepared question. Um, what would your two top priorities be to reduce our county's traffic congestion and growing gridlock? And I'd like to start with George Leventhal. First of all, I want to say hello to Elia Hopkins running for county council and Lida Astro running for board of education. These candidates work so hard they deserve to be acknowledged. My top two priorities, if I can only pick two, would be the Purple Line and the Quarter Cities Transit Way. I also believe we need to dramatically expand bus service. I won preliminary planning dollars for bus rapid transit on Veers Mill Road and Georgia Avenue. We're all interested in expanding bus rapid transit even further, and Councilmember Elrich has done a great deal of work on laying out a proposal whereby that could happen. I think we will see, uh, interestingly enough, the first bus rapid transit uh, line on the intercounty connector. We will also see express bus service on I-270, and so I think there's great opportunities there. I do believe we need to invest in better roads as well, uh, but if I only get two priorities, it would be the Purple Line. I co-founded Purple Line Now, the advocacy organization that helped to persuade Governor O'Malley to choose the master plan alignment for the Purple Line along the Georgetown branch as the state's preferred local alternative. If Governor O'Malley is reelected, if President Obama is reelected, we will get the Purple Line in my next term on the county council. Thank you. Uh, Next, Mr. Narianan, please. 
Uh, I don't believe public transport alone will solve the problem. First thing is you need to people um, you need to give an incentive to people to get to the public transport. I would actually suggest first a congestion tax, and this would be for for all employers, depending upon uh, on a per employee basis, depending upon the distance the employee lives from the work. Longer the distance from a work, the higher the tax. And on this basis, you provide an incentive to pe for people to live closer to work. And the second thing I would suggest is, in this county, while we, are, we have a confusion between seeking growth, expanding infrastructure, and locking up certain inconsistencies, like locking up large parcels of land which you won't develop and things like that, we need to look at all of these in a sensible and comprehensive way so that there is organized and planned development or a choice to slow development. But we cannot have on one side pulling one and the other. This inconsistency has to be removed. Thank you so much. Uh, Nancy Foreen. Um, well, let me just say this. Uh, we, the county has a long list of transportation priorities, a multi-billion dollar list, which is at this point meaningless. And why is it meaningless? It's because there is no revenue coming in from the state or federal governments for transportation funding. Uh, this is a, a lovely a academic conversation, but until we actually generate uh, get our money back from the state, they've taken our highway user dollars to fund the state budget right now. We don't see that coming back for at least three years. Uh, at the federal level, we have the same kinds of problems. They've not uh, approved the reauthorization of the Surface Transportation Act. So there are no, no additional revenues coming from that level. Uh, I've been fighting as chair of the Transportation and Environment Committee for transportation funding solutions for eight years years at the federal level and at the state level. And I'm hopeful that the governor's uh, new blue ribbon task force on transportation funding will get us somewhere and just won't be the usual report on the shelf added to all the others. Thank you so much. Mr. Evans. Start the answer, uh, my response to the answer with asking a question I do in these forums. How many of you came to this meeting today on public transportation? Two hands just went up. I think, uh, I think one of the things that we have to really think about is our attitude about cars. I read an article in the Washington Post the other day that said we are getting more involved and more uh, bound to our automobiles. So that has to be part of the discussion. I also believe that the development process has to be looked at because if we look at the recent Science City uh, project, and if we look at uh, White Flint, are those two development projects really helping us or harming us in terms of how we move people around this county? I don't see us with a comprehensive plan of transportation. I think the purple, to answer the question specifically, I think the purple line is a good start, but I don't, do not believe that we have a comprehensive plan. I am not a transportation expert, but I do know that in the 50s and 60s, when I lived in Pittsburgh, I didn't hesitate to take a trolley or a bus because it was convenient and it was near my home. And we don't have that kind of basic fundamental structure. Maybe I don't understand everything, but we need to figure it out. Thank you so much. Mr. Reamer. Well, the first thing I would do is I would work hard to protect Metro. That is the backbone of our economy, our community here in Montgomery County. And I'm hearing from people every day who say that they used to take Metro and now they're driving. We've got to hold Metro accountable to get the escalators fixed, to restore service. We've got to hold Martin O'Malley accountable for our long-term funding commitments. And we've got to get Metro back to the, being the world-class system that it used to be. The second thing I would do is get the purple line going. Uh, that is critical. We're going to have to push hard in our state, and I'm proud to have been endorsed by nearly 10 members of our county state delegation. We need to work as one voice to get the funding that we need out of the state to get the purple line going and then push aggressively to get the money from the federal government. What I'd also say about this is my, my passion for public transportation is not because I think everybody should stop driving. I drive all over the county. It's, we're all going to continue to drive. It's the opposite. It's to make sure that you can still drive in this county. Because if we keep adding roads at the same pace, adding cars at the same pace over the next 50 years as we did over the last 50, no one's going to be able to drive anywhere. Thank you so much. Mr. Elrich. Um, I'll say the easy thing, and that's to try to get the Purple Line funded and built. And then I'll talk a little bit about bus rapid transit. Um, 
I've proposed a system, a 120-mile network of transit lines that would crisscross the county north, south, and east, west. I worked extensively with the development community to get their buy-in to this proposal because I didn't think you could do this unless they were part of that equation. And I worked with the environmental and civic community to also get their support. We have support at the state level. We've got a study going forward for, for $500,000. It'll come back this fall. We've been approached by three major multinational corporations that have asked about doing the project as a public-private partnership. When confronted with the question that somebody asked me early on about what about the money, my response was we need to think outside of the box. And so among the things we're looking at is creating development district taxes or transit district taxes um, as a way of helping fund this project. And again, this is something the development community is interested in. In addition, um, they're interested in looking at parking restrictions to help this all work. Thank you so much. Ms. Trachtenberg. Well, clearly the focus does need to be on public transportation. And I have had a long commitment, long-term commitment, to building uh, the Purple Line and certainly see the great promise of a comprehensive bus rapid transit system here in Montgomery County. Uh, but I think there are some other things that we probably want to think about as we talk about public transportation. One is how integral it is really to effective development and redevelopment and as the council makes decisions on that and certainly in the conversations and decision making that we uh, uh, took part in around the Great Seneca Science Corridor in White Flint, uh, we were looking at public transportation and how vital it was to the success of those projects. We also know that in the East County, as we look to redevelop there, that one of the things we have to obviously make considerable investments in is some adequate public transportation on that side of town. But the real issue is money, and it's not just going to happen with state dollars. It has to happen with federal dollars. So I'm all for a collaborative strategy as we continue thank to try to move forward. Thank you so much. Uh, Ms. Dwinter. Talking about uh, top priorities, if we're talking about individual projects within the county, I certainly think that the Purple Line, Quarter Cities Transit Way, as well as expanded bus road and um, system are very important and, are, and really uh, are the steps that we should be taking in order to increase access to transit, increase the capacity of transit. Uh, I think that the key to all of this, as people have said, is money. And in terms of an overarching priority, I think one of the most important things is to work with people at the state level because the state has to stop removing money from the Transportation Trust Fund to use for other general purposes so that it will be available for transportation transit projects in the counties. And unless we can get uh, that solution or that problem fixed, we won't have the money to move ahead on the critical transit projects that we need for this county. Thank you. Ms. Wagner. While we're waiting for a gazillion dollars for the Purple Line and for the CCT, I think that we have to, uh, I agree, Hans, that we absolutely have to make sure that Metro is affordable and reliable, but we have to back up and think about our ride on bus. Are the routes efficient and effective? Folks are not going to get out of their cars unless it's efficient and effective. I have a 17-minute reverse commute to Rockville. It takes me an hour and 14 minutes on the bus. I just don't have the time. And then if I miss that bus, then I am really late because it doesn't come again quickly. So we have to, we have to look at that. I would suggest that it's time for a gas tax at the state level, but I'm not sure that that wouldn't then become the operating fund for the state of Maryland. So we have to make sure that that piece doesn't happen. And the reason people won't get out of their cars and the reason things are congested is that we have no affordable housing in this county. Teachers, firefighters, police officers, kitchen workers, nurses' aides, everyone is coming from stop from Frederick or elsewhere. Sorry. That's a different <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay, next question. The county has had several difficult budget years as a result of the recession, and projections indicate several more difficult budget years ahead. Name your three most important areas where limited budget funds should be spent in your estimation. Let's start with Jane DeWinter. 
Well, I'm, I'm very concerned about two things. One, which is maintaining a critical the safety net services that we need. I think that we have a moral obligation when we have people who are homeless, who are hungry, who are, have no access to health care to help them. And especially in these tough times when there's more people than ever that need our help in that regard, I think that that's the first place that we need to look. And then secondly, I turn to things that I consider investments in our future. And that is education, that is investments in transportation projects that we need to increase, to decrease commuting time so people are more productive. Uh, it's things that are future oriented. Uh, that without those, we're uh, impairing our ability to carry on and to provide the best life that we can for the people who live in this county. Thank you. Mr. Elrich. My three priorities would be, first of all, education, because we, we can't afford to turn out a generation of people who are ill-prepared to work and ill-prepared to function. And so I think that's absolutely important. I think protecting the safety net services in the county is, is essential. And as, as the times get economically more difficult, we've only seen the demands on our services increase, and we've got to be able to provide them. And the third thing I, that I would focus on is, is really building out a transit system so that we're prepared when, you, when we get out of the recession to actually have a reasonable amount of development and growth that doesn't bury everybody, because we have to protect our quality of life. And so I think it's critical to be to, to be on a track to be ready for when things get better and have things in place that enable us to, to do the kind of things we want to do in Montgomery County. And I, those would be my three priorities for now. Thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Evans. My three priorities are as follows. First is education. It's probably going to be said by many of us, but I also believe that it's the, the uh, sounding, the, the, I believe that it is the strong suit of our county. Secondly, strong safety and security and fire and rescue services. I think sometimes we don't talk about that very much because we have what I believe is a strong police force and strong fire and rescue services, but I think we also have to make sure we maintain that and start to deal with issues in this county that for a long time we ignored, but we're, we're more open about it now in terms of our gang initiatives and, and some of the more dangerous places in our county that we should be talking more openly about. And third, I think we need to provide and continue to provide services for those who cannot afford those services, as been said by other council members. We cannot ignore it. We have issues with health and human services uh, provision for citizens, and we need to make sure we provide those services. Thank you so much. Nancy Florine. My three priorities have been, and will always be, um, uh, education funding, public safety funding, and preserving, uh, supporting our safety net for our very most vulnerable uh, citizens. Uh, it is such a challenge. Uh, uh, everyone wants us to fund every project uh, of every sort, and it's easy to expand those uh, to satisfy those constituencies. But I really think those are the heart and soul of Montgomery County, education, public safety, and preserving our most vulnerable. Thank you. Mr. Leventhal. Uh, both Fred and Nancy are correct, and the answers that they gave you in this order, education, public safety, which includes both police and fire, and health and human services are in fact in that order the top priorities in the county budget and they have been for many years and we all share a dedication to those priorities. When you talk about education, it is our future. When you talk about public safety and health and human services, it is literally a matter of life or death. You are literally making decisions that may determine whether people live or die. Having said that, and when we say that, there will always be someone in the audience who says, well, what about me? What about libraries? What about parks? What about planning, what about transportation, and all of these needs are vital. I heard my friend Mr. Reamer say that we shouldn't fund the bad programs, and I'm looking forward to his providing the list of the bad programs. I've been through the budget line by line every year for the last eight years. There is no program in county government that does not meet a vital need, and so the reality is when you're in office, you have to cut things that are important to constituents, and this council has made those tough choices. Year after year, we've balanced the budget, and we'll do it again next year. Thank you. Mr. Narayanan. 
My three priorities are not different from Nancy Florine's. The uh, taking care of the future of the young, taking care of the old who have paid their dues, the second, and the third one is public safety. However, I do question the premise that it is the recession is the sole cause of the problem. That's half a truth only. The other part of it is people don't realize that between 2001 and 2005, when the real estate values were increasing, as a result of that, the real estate taxes were increasing. Those taxes were spent on hiring a thousand more county employees and increasing the wages of everyone. And that is the second part of the truth that nobody wants to mention. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Reamer. Well, if we do a good job going into all the budgets and becoming more efficient, and that's actually what I was trying to say when I used the word bad, it was duplicative spending. Um, if we do a good job, we can come out of this stronger than ever. Look at GM, it's returning to profitability. Look at Ford, uh, it has continued strong profitability. So our future can be bright if we do a good job of becoming more efficient right now. I think our priorities First, our education. It's the most important thing we do, and we cannot take it for granted. Our demographics are changing rapidly in this county. The demand and the challenge of providing good education is growing and growing and growing. So we have to rise to meet that challenge. Uh, services for the vulnerable, our safety net, making us a decent place to live, not just a great, you know, wonderful place, but a decent place to live. And of course, public transportation, which I think is critical to our long-term ability to bring in jobs, and to bring in housing, which is truly the key to our tax base and our ability to provide for ourselves in this county. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Trackenberg. The three priorities that have been embraced by this council and also by the executive, as repeated by my colleagues, have been education, public safety, and also the needs of the vulnerable. And it's really those needs that have spoken to my heart. Uh, each and every day. Uh, I often tell people that I don't get calls about street lights and potholes. I get calls about children who need services, who have special needs. I get calls about people like my son who are mentally ill. I get calls from adults my age who are trying to deal with parents, elderly parents, finding them housing, finding them services. And in my mind, you need to put people first at a point like this, especially when money is tight. Because the people that we're talking about are not strangers. They're our neighbors, our family, people that we work with, and how we choose to treat them or not treat them is a reflection of what kind of a community we are. So I hope, no matter how difficult our times are, we'll continue to put people first. Thank you so much. Ms. Wagner. So I would say education, safety net, education also in terms of job, job training, safety net in terms of if you've ever looked a person in the eye who said they needed your help and you couldn't help them, you knew how you felt, not only how they felt. But I would really say a third priority needs to be, if we're going to dig ourselves out of this hole, how are we going to incentivize good jobs here in Montgomery County? Microsoft, six months ago, brought 500 jobs to Friendship Heights in a building that was ready to receive those jobs. And when I asked the county, what great, what did we do to incentivize? The answer was nothing. So I said, oh, okay, so the state incentivized those jobs. No. So if there's low-hanging fruit, 500 Microsoft jobs at a transit in Friendship Heights in a building already ready, we need to look for opportunities so we aren't talking about shrinking anymore. Thank you so much. That concludes uh, our first section with the prepared questions. And now I'm going to start using questions from the audience. As you remember, uh, we shortened the answers. However, those have 30 second responses. So we're going to try to get, I know, we're going to try to get a few more going a little faster. So um, uh, we'll, we'll pick up the pace, but I thank you all for adhering uh, to the timer. You've been great. So with that first question, and I'm going to throw this to Mr. Narayanan to start the question. Only two of nine candidates mentioned the environment in opening statements, yet our environmental resources are one of this county's major assets as a place to live. Please address your environmental priorities. 
Environment is a very big, a very big priority. However, environment does not mean agricultural preservation. Environment means keeping the air and the greenery around over here and not polluting the places. And we need to take a balanced approach to environmental balance where we don't think of the wrong things as the environment, but the right things so that we are able to have a balanced development while keeping a good environment. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Leventhal, same question. Yeah. I authored the change to the county's energy policy that today means that we get 30% of all of the electricity we buy from clean, renewable wind power. I authored one of America's strongest green buildings laws, which means that all new construction in, Muscom in Montgomery County must meet strict environmental sustainability standards. I'm the co-founder of Bethesda Green, which is a private-public partnership which encourages sustainable living at the local level and is Maryland's first green jobs incubator. We just passed some of the strongest stormwater protection uh, rules in America under Nancy Florine's leadership at the Transportation and Environment Committee. Environmental issues have been a priority for me throughout my eight years on the council. They will be if you reelect me. Thank you, sir. Uh, okay, Ms. Florine. Thank you. Uh, this county has preserved almost 50% uh, of its land in uh, public open space. Uh, or private open space through easements. Um, we, I initiated green building tax credit several years ago, and I've chaired the region's air quality committee, and we have a number of sustainability on, uh, initiatives ongoing in this county. I absolutely agree that preserving our environment is a key element of preserving our quality of life. It's about safety, and it's about community. Thank you. Mr. Evans. I'd like to see us um, really do a better job at recycling in Montgomery County. It may, may seem like a simplistic answer, but I, I am very impressed with the process that we have at our local homes and uh, our local communities, but I'm a little concerned when I go out in the public and go out to other agencies and communities where the recycling process isn't going on. So that's one area. Another area is I believe that we have to improve going back to transportation, our transportation system, so that more people get out of their cars and start using public transportation, and that will solve many of our problems. Okay, Mr. Reamer. Well, I'm passionately committed to changing the way that we approach development to prioritize walking and biking and public transportation, and I think that's crucial to our long-term environmental sustainability in the county and the ability of future generations of families to come here and feel that this is a great place to live with a high quality of life. Um, I'd also say that uh, we're going to have to make sure we are able to prioritize environmental mitigation programs in our budget, uh, which is going to be a continuing challenge. Um, and again, the, the future of transportation really has to be on the council agenda, public transportation. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Elrich. I supported legislation that um, strengthened the stormwater laws. I supported the legislation, and I hope it will eventually get passed, that we get Montgomery County to a no net loss of tree cover um, on the, um, it's a, on the forest rest, in a forest preservation act. And my proposal on BRT was referred to by some of the government's governor's staff as the only thing they've seen right now that would actually reduce vehicle miles traveled, which was important to them because reducing vehicle miles traveled knocks down CO2. And there aren't many other ways you can do that short of taking cars off the road. Thank you. Ms. Trackenberg. Well, every uh, incumbent that's sitting up here has sponsored or co-sponsored really important environmental legislation. And the council over the course of the last four years has focused on a number of things, not just uh, storm management issues recently, but we've looked at incentives for businesses and for homeowners. In fact, one of our biggest frustrations in the budget season was the fact that we really couldn't produce more money for those programs because we know how important they are. Uh, I don't see that commitment changing down the road. I think we know the environment is our future, so it's critically important. Mr. Winter, thank you. 
There are a number of uh, areas or approaches to improving environmental quality or safeguarding it. One of them, of course, is stormwater management. We have um, some new stormwater regulations that the state has just finalized this spring in response to laws that were passed in 2007 and what we were looking toward redevelopment projects being able to improve the stormwater systems that are in place or are not in place as the case may be. We also are have to bear in mind development in sensitive areas. There are a number of areas where there's uh, watershed issues or, or we want to preserve the, um, the area around these watersheds. We have also Sorry. Thank you. Ms. Wagner. Okay, I'm concerned about the watershed, particularly questions that have to be resolved by the community about Ten Mile Creek. When I worked for the Senator 15 years ago, we were part of an initiative to start cleaning up the Anacostia. The Anacostia River is not any cleaner today than it was 15 years ago. So if we're going to have mandates, we need to be fully committed to them. So I'm worried about the watershed and the development related to that. And I'm also worried about as we grow density in high-rise apartment buildings, how are we making it possible for folks to do good recycling? Thank you all so much. Again, we're continuing with the 30-second responses and our second audience question. What is your position on the DD supplement, i.e., the supplemental funding for services for people with de developmental disabilities who live in Montgomery County? And why don't we start uh, with Mr. Leventhal? I've consistently supported augmenting the state wage subsidy for those who provide assistance to profoundly, severely disabled uh, children and adults in our community. This year, all nonprofit providers were proposed to receive a 7% cut by County Executive Leggett with leadership from Councilmember Trachtenberg and all of us. We reduced that only to a 5% cut, but it's still a cut. And there were some changes made to the supplement in wages for developmentally disabled care providers, but it's a very high priority for the County Council. I'm confident that we will continue to support it. Thank you so much. Mr. Narayanan. There is a continuum between the neighborhood association, the county uh, government, the local, uh, the uh, state government, and the federal government. We cannot get into the roles where the state and federal government have, uh, have the room for redistribution of income. In the case of the county, we need to make sure that all programs that go beyond the common element maintenance are funded by the state and federal government. We need to be very, very careful we don't start pay, uh, picking the pockets of the county taxpayers. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Florine. Thank you. Um, I, as Councilmember Leventhal said, um, under his leadership and that of Councilmember Trachtenberg, we did restore some of the dollars to that supplement. Uh, this was a time of shared sacrifice across agencies, and this, this group falls within our most vulnerable. There's no question about that, and it's a group I will continue to uh, find a way to support even through, through these tough budget times. I'm hopeful uh, that we will not go lower uh, to preserve that group. Thank you. Mr. Evans. Of course, I'm in support of the funding, and it should be at an appropriate level. I think this is another example of where we need to pull all parties together, all agencies together, to figure out the best ways that we can help our most needy and our vulnerable. We talk a good game about that, but when it actually occurs and we have to make cuts, we make the cuts. And I think we have to stop doing that and make sure it's a high priority. Thank you, Mr. Reamer. Well, this is the kind of service that I really think we have to work hard to protect. I mean, you've got families who, where the parents are in their 70s or 80s taking care of their children who are in their 50s with profound disabilities. Um, and those families are not getting the support that they need. And Montgomery County's provision of services is not actually on par with many other counties and jurisdictions around the country. So. Um, when we look to save money, this is the kind of area we should really try to protect as much as possible. Thank you. Mr. Elrich? I think that George and Nancy explained what the county did um, fairly well. This is a, a personal issue to me. I raised two Down syndrome foster children, so I understand the issue of developmental disabilities and, and, and what it means. 
Um, we had a very difficult budget year. We made some very, very difficult choices. Um, but I think that's a priority. This is, this is the kind of thing that this council will support. I don't agree with this as something where you say if the state doesn't fund it and the federal government doesn't fund it, that we turn our backs. One of the best things about representing people in Montgomery County is you don't expect us to turn our backs on people in need. Thank you. Mrs. Trachtenberg. Well, as indicated by my colleagues, this was something that came up this budget season, and I thank them for their support in what we were able to accomplish, which I had first recommending, which is re 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 reducing um, the, de the number down to 5% from the 7 that had been proposed by Mr. Leggett. But, you know, this is one of those hard issues that we're going to continue to grapple with, and in my mind, what we've really got to start talking about, too, is what we do with the state about this, because their support has simply been inadequate, and I'm really concerned that it's going to continue to decline. Thank you. And Ms. DeWinter. Well, I have to echo that sentiment that the support from the state has really not been forthcoming, and that's one of the reasons why uh, our legislators were trying to get an alcohol tax passed at the state level to increase support for uh, adults with developmental disabilities. Uh, I do think that we have an obligation, though, to to a, to meet the needs of these people, and I think that uh, I, I don't want to rely on say if the state isn't going to do it that we're going to turn our back. I do believe that this is an area that we have to be very careful with. I'd like to see more uh, cooperation with the nonprofits. Thank you, Ms. Wagner. For those who are listening, this is a pretty important issue because historically, the state has underfunded this service, and the Montgomery County government has been able to backfill those costs. That is no longer the case, and what we have are the very most vulnerable children and adults who now cannot receive nervousness. It's compounded by the fact that the cost of living in Montgomery County makes it extremely hard to hire qualified people at a fair wage because the state is simply not sufficient. Okay, thank you. We'll go to the next question again. 30 second responses, you all are doing great. Uh, the development associated with the Great Seneca Corridor Plan will result in 40,000 additional workers and approximately 10,000 additional residents. It is staged with the construction of the Corridor City's Transitway, uh, which carries, will carry only about 12 to 15 percent of the workers and residents which will leave thousands of additional cars on the road. How can you justify this and explain your support um, to the residents? And why don't we start with Mr. Elrich? I thought the uh, project was excessive. I thought it went beyond where it should have gone. I supported the redevelopment on most of the parcels around what's now called Science City, but I thought the particularly development on Bellward campus was more than should have been allowed. That it should, if it was going to be allowed at all, it should have been done Later in the future, this is supposed to be a 40-year plan. There is no reason for us to pour all the development into it now. We should have done it in stages and seen 20 years from now or 15 years from now where we were and what would be appropriate for the next stage of development. Thank you. Ms. Dwinter. There are two things that I'll bring up, one of which is that it is critical because this is bringing so many jobs here over the next 30 to 40 years. It is absolutely essential that the county make the investment in infrastructure that it committed to make in this plan. Uh, the staging provides one mechanism for doing that, but we, we, we need to, to hold firm and come up with the money in order to provide the transportation options that are in the plan. The second thing is that I think that we need to connect our transportation network to existing neighborhoods to take additional cars off. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Okay, Mr. Evans, please. So a lot of problems. I live very near this uh, Science City, and from what I've heard from community activists uh, before I got into this process was that the process was one that wasn't really open and transparent, although that's not one of my favorite words. So that I think that we need to look at this process to be sure that all community members know it looks like this will be an immense uh, transportation boondoggle and one that we have to look at very carefully in the next 40 years. 
Thank you so much. Mr. Narayanan. There is a basic incons inconsistency in the county in not equating development and environment. They don't really go together, environment balance and uh, too much of development. We need to make sure that if we are going to represent those who seek conservation, greenery, and environmental balance, we need to cap the development. This project was inconsistent because uh, development also brings congestion and all the problems which you see. Thank you, Ms. Florine. Thank you. Like any other master plan in Montgomery County, uh, the Great Seneca Science Quarter Plan has, uh, has a vision. Uh, will that vision be implemented over the course of 40 years? We don't know for sure, because it's tied so closely to the development of infrastructure and to worrying about all the things that community members are concerned about in terms of traffic congestion and the like. Uh, so any project, should it come to fruition, will have to satisfy so many rules that I'm confident that these concerns will be addressed. I'll note that Council delayed the plan in order to hear more from the community and to work out some better uh, language and compromises. Thank you. Mr. Leventhal. Uh, Councilmember Phil Andrews and Councilmember Mark Elrich were uh, opposed to the plan in the beginning. They offered amendments. They had a lot of input. And finally, the Great Seneca Science Corridor plan passed unanimously with all nine of us supporting it because of the hope that over the next 30 to 40 years, we can leverage the existing facilities, Johns Hopkins University, University of Maryland, Shady Grove, and Shady Grove Hospital, and construct the corridor city's transit way without which this project is not to occur. And there is staging, and it is a 30-year plan, but it will attract good jobs, high-tech, high-wage, science-based, future-oriented jobs that will lift our economy and improve our quality of life. Thank you, sir. OK. Uh, Ms. Wagner. I think what we're really talking about is not trusting each other. I think that the citizens don't feel they have reason to trust the planning board and the county council, and I think it's probably vice versa on the county council. The city of Rockville and the city of Gaithersburg felt like they didn't receive enough input. There's one way to, to solve that, and that is to be open and transparent from day one as opposed to playing catch up. Um, the, the good news is, is that this does have 50 years to play itself out. Thank you. Ms. Trackenberg. <clears throat> well, the council worked on this for a number of months, and I thought we were very thoughtful, and as council member Leventhal indicated, ultimately we got there, but not without a lot of public debate and also a lot of input from the community, and not just from the civic activists, but from the business folks as well. And one of the things that I raised consistently was the fact that as we you know, face these difficult economic times, we need to find innovative ways and important ways to expand our tax base. And with redevelopment, that's how that will happen. Uh, and the way we stage the project, I'm confident that we're going to get there. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Reamer. Well, I always felt that the project relied too much on putting cars on the road, and I spoke out during the debate over the future of Gaithersburg West, and I tried to push the council as much as I could in favor of a different model. Um, I think it was that engagement, that substantive engagement on the issue, that led to the endorsement by four members of the Gaithersburg City Council, many of whom felt that they weren't properly heard uh, during the process. So um, I did engage, and I believe that the plan could have been much more effective, uh, but it is important to the future of the county. Okay, thank you. Okay, we're going to, we've <clears throat> now gone through that question. I'd like to change questions. And the next question from the audience. What effect do you think the 9-0 requirement for the council to raise the property tax is having on the county. Uh, wh why don't we start with Mr. Leventhal? So far, I don't actually think it's had any effect. Um, we worked very well together in the course of this budget, and we did not exceed the charter limit. We did not exceed the charter limit last year either. Um, obviously, nine different personalities could lead to a different outcome. I was not in favor of the nine vote requirement, but I respect the will of the voters, and it is in the charter now. Um, if Mr. Ficker, the author of the Charter Amendment, were elected to the Council, I assume the 
personal dynamic and the ability to reach consensus would be quite different, or if other <laughs> council members who came from a very different perspective. But this council worked very, very well through this budget, and I don't think the nine vote requirement mattered much. Thank you. Mr. Narayanan. The nine vote requirement is the greatest protection that the county taxpayers have, and we should have it. And this is what has prevented, this is what has caused this crisis. But the crisis is also the making of the uh, council members over the last 10 years. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Florine. Uh, the question had to do with uh, the nine vote limit on uh, raising the property taxes. You have to, uh, this job is not about showboating. It's not about grandstanding. It's not about saying, no, no, no. It's about solving problems. I think if, this, if the council, whoever's on the council, sees a serious problem that not, cannot be addressed any other way but by, address, but by raising property taxes, there might be nine votes for that. Um, I don't think you can generalize. Thank you. Mr. Evans. <clears throat> Well, I have to say publicly I was the treasurer for the committee that fought the nine vote uh, uh, measure and I was not, that committee was not successful. However, I think it comes back to whether it's nine or eight that we work together as a team and I think that's what's important in terms of this process. Uh, we can raise the property tax but it has to do with the limitation of that raise and I think we have to work as a team to do that. Thank you. Mr. Reamer. Well, I think that if the council hadn't raised the property tax when times were good to fund budgets that were going up at a rate of 10 to 15 percent a year, there wouldn't have been the backlash that produced the Ficker Amendment, which put the 9-0 requirement in place. I don't necessarily think that it's having a big effect right now, but there are many states around the country that have these kind of fiscal straitjackets. They go into bankruptcy, their schools deteriorate, the quality of life ends. It can happen here, too. Thank you. Mr. Elrich. I've been here a long time, and I grew up at a time when Prince George's County and Montgomery County were roughly equivalent. And then Prince George's County passed the Trim Amendment. And their ability to invest in schools and invest in their infrastructure and invest in their community led to very different directions for our county and their county. I think this is a bad law, but it's a law we have to live with. And I don't think it's affected our deliberations, and it's certainly not going to affect our, the deliberations we make in the future. We are going to have to figure out what resources we need to provide the services that you ask for. And you're going to have to listen very carefully to candidates who promise everything and then say no tax cut, no tax increases. Thank you. Mr. Actenberg. Well, uh, let's put it into perspective which is when the council has had to go over the charter limit, it's always been done unanimously. So I think Council Member Leventhal is correct in stating that there hasn't been any impact from this law, and there probably will not be in the future. That doesn't mean that it shouldn't be changed. But I want to also rebut something that was said by Mr. Reamer about county government growth, which is since this council was seated in 2006, the rate of growth has decreased each year to the point where there was no growth. There was negative growth this year, obviously brought about by reality. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Winter, please. I was against the, the Ficker Amendment. I'm not looking forward to raising taxes if I were elected, but I think that there does come a time when there's a consensus that there's something out there that we really value and that is very important, whether it's preserving your safety net, if we have several more uh, very severe years in this economic recession, or whether there's other conditions. And I would like to think that people, the voters, will elect people who understand that sometimes people come before taxes and that that's more important and that the members of the council will be able to work together if a situation like that arises and so that the requirement to have nine people won't make a difference. Thank you. Ms. Wagner. I'm a progressive Democrat and I expect to pay taxes. 
I expect them to pay for education, fire and safety, parks and libraries, and care for the most vulnerable. Where we get into trouble is when those services start to fall away and we're still paying those taxes. That said, I chaired the 2002 effort, and Fred, we were successful then, uh, in, uh, in uh, preventing the Ficker Amendment from coming into law. There are times when we must have tax increases, but certainly not before we've been careful stewards of the county taxpayer's dollar. Thank you. Before we move to the next question, Mr. Reamer, you were challenged. Do you want to, uh, you've got 30 yeah. seconds. I, I can understand why uh, the council member would rebut that. I, I was speaking specifically of three years of the spending increase, 2004, uh, the, the spending increase was 11%, 2005 was 11.3%, 2006 was 14.1%. Imagine that third year, that 14% increase was on top of a budget that had already grown that much. So that is indeed uh, a big part of how we got here today. We have another rebuttal. Yes, Ms. Florine. I haven't done all the research, uh, but I will remind people that's when we added all day kindergarten. If you think that's a bad idea, be that way. Uh, but I think that's a really important kind of investment for Montgomery County. It was a major cost driver in, a, on, in the Montgomery County budget during that time. Thank you. Okay, next question from the audience. Do you believe in adhering to master plans and having the infrastructure in place before allowing more development? Uh, why don't we start with Mr. Elrich? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> I mean, like I said in, in the beginning, the things I tried to do is to tie development to the provision of infrastructure and to make sure that, that we collect enough money from impact fees to pay for the infrastructure. We, we need a plan. And to let things go forward and simply say the development will go and maybe we'll get around to the infrastructure leads to exactly the problem that we inherited today that I got when I was on the council, which is absolute total congestion on the roads and schoolyards that look like portable cities. And we really needed to, we needed to take a different approach, and I want to give this council credit for moving in that direction. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Winter. Yes, I do. And when I served as president of the Montgomery County Council of PTAs, and for years before that, I was the advocate and the leader on efforts to make school capacity tests tighter in the annual growth policy to make sure that money collected from impact fees would be spent to actually relieve the capacity issues in schools. And that's something that I will continue to believe and work for. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Evans. This is an easy one, yes, but I also believe that we need to look at how we make decisions about infrastructure and how we make decisions about what schools and what uh, communities that we assist. I know that some schools are moved down on the list in terms of uh, repairs and, and additions and all those kinds of things, and the whole process needs to be looked at. Thank you so much. Mr. Narayanan. I completely agree. Infrastructure must come before development. Thank you. <laughs> Ms. Warren. I've been working on this issue since 1986 when I first became a member of the County Planning Board, and I will remind you all that this is the county that didn't allow the ICC to be built for 40 years. That was infrastructure before, uh, that was not provided. Uh, before development. And of course there's negative feelings about that because that's the challenge of providing infrastructure. How do you do that in, con in concert with community concerns? I think there's no easy to answer to that, but our rules do require the provision of infrastructure to support the new development, and we will continue to do that. Thank you. Mr. Leventhal. Yes, our goal should be that infrastructure is present to support proposed development. Ms. Wagner. So perhaps we need to talk about community engagement here. Does everyone feel like they've been part of a constructive plan for the master plan? Do they feel their voice was heard? Do we have a system that allows input in real time? Do we have uh, every neighbor feeling heard? Because that's the trick. If you feel like you were heard, then you feel that it's been a more honest process. We have to do some of these things simultaneously. Some things have to come before and after, but if everyone's been part of that decision, it's bearable. Thank you. And Ms. Trachtenberg. 
Well, I would certainly agree that the infrastructure needs to uh, happen and come up online before there's the development. And what I would share with all of you and those that are listening is that this council um, did some important work in this regard. And it was during uh, the last discussion around growth policy that we actually looked at the issue of school capacity and reduced it further, again, with Council Member Elridge's leadership. Thank you, Mr. Reamer. Well, the critical concept here is staging. And it used to be, you know, Route 29 in the East County, uh, they allowed the development to come and they had a plan for transit and then the transit never came but the development came. That's happened all throughout. We have to change the way that we do it and we're starting to now, but we've got to push harder. You can't continue through the next stage of the development if you aren't achieving the goals that you have for the first stages about ridership on transit, walking, and biking. When we change the rules so that you can't proceed without that, then the incentive will be there to make that possible. Thank you. <clears throat> next question. What is your plan for the county park police? Okay, that's... Oh, why don't we start with Becky Wagner, please. Well, I think the back and forth during the budget season, talking about what was the thing to do with the county police and the park police was not the best way to make that decision. Do those questions have to be examined? Absolutely. Here's the challenge. If the goal was to save money, park police do not get paid what county police get paid, so then they would have to be absorbed into that pay scale. And we have county police who are not experienced in the parks, in the wooded sections. There's nothing sexy about this discussion, but it's the only way if you get to the facts. Thank you. Ms. Trachtenberg. Well, we, the council actually, in a very wise fashion, asked for this to be evaluated, and we're expecting a report, I believe, in the autumn that's going to give us uh, uh, some sense of what the trade-offs would be. And it's also important to remember, as we look at consolidation efforts, that this is a practice that has happened successfully in other jurisdictions. So this isn't something that's just unique to this county. It's been employed other places and has proven to be a success. That doesn't mean we're going to do it, but it's certainly worth evaluating. Thank you. Mr. Reamer. Well, I'm not persuaded at this time that merging the park police into the county police uh, will save money or will will be able to maintain service levels and the park police are preventative uh, the county police I don't think will be able to play the same preventative role in the parks and they'll become less safe and then people won't want to spend as much time there and on top of that I'm not convinced that they'll be able to save money through this initiative in the first place there are some uh, back-end systems that we can collaborate on uh, to have efficiency, but service level is the key thing. Thank you. Mr. Narayanan. This is a potential example of process reengineering or reorganization in order to bring savings. I'm not saying whether it's the right thing to do or not, and that's what the study is all about, but this is something we need to keep an open mind about and see if there is potential not to reduce service and yet save costs. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Leventhal. If consolidating the park police with the county police will maintain the safety of our parks and save us money, I will support it. If it fails to meet either of those tests, I will not. Ms. Florine. Uh, what I've heard about uh, this issue, as far as I understand it, uh, park police uh, merging uh, does not save the county money and would run the risk of losing thousands and thousands and thousands of volunteer hours that are currently provided uh, free of charge from our committed community uh, interested in supporting our, our park police. We're looking at ways to, to achieve efficiencies uh, and there's a study that is going on with respect to communications and even that has its own set of issues. So these things are easier uh, suggested than actually implemented. Thank you. Mr. Evans. Everything being equal, I am totally opposed to the merging of the two agencies. Uh, when I heard the idea, I met 
with representatives from the Park Police because I wasn't as aware as I should have been probably about the kind of services that they provide. But based on my experience of working with the county police, I was the school that had the first school resource officer in 1997 at Gaithersburg. So I understand, I think, the operations of the police department. I'm opposed to the, uh, the merging of the two because of their very different missions. Thank you, Mr. Elrich. I, I support the study going forward, and I don't see any reason if you lay out a clear set of objectives, for example, what you want park police to do, why we can't explore a merger. Nobody was talking about firing or getting rid of the park police. Nobody was proposing simply merging these people into the county police force. The, the issue being studied is can you provide what's currently being provided and get rid of the chief of the park police, the deputy chief of the park police, all the support staff over there, the use of human resources over there, their separate repair shop and their separate dispatch operation. If we can't look at a question like this and say, how do we preserve what we value and do it in a more efficient way, how are we going to do anything that we need to do that's in front of us? Thank you. Uh, Mr. Winter. Well, I've also met with the Park Police, and I understand that there are a lot of complicated issues or points involved in this, some of which have mentioned there's also a matter of a state law, there's a matter of a pension system, a matter of uh, equivalent qualifications. But I do think it's worth looking at. We need, it's the responsibility to ask these questions and find out whether there are ways to have savings. But I think that it's very important from the outset to figure out what is the level of service that we need to preserve, what is it that makes the Park Police able to ensure that our parks are very safe and that we preserve that regardless of what we do. Thank you. Um, we have, this will be our final question before we go into closing statements. <clears throat> what role does the council have in controlling the expenses of the public schools? If the council doesn't, who does? Uh, why don't we start with Mr. Leventhal? Our role is to appropriate the money, and we certainly can appropriate less than the school board requests. We are not able to allocate those savings. The school board does that. We had a very difficult uh, and contentious uh, struggle with the school board this year. I've heard some of my uh, friends here who are seeking office suggest that that was uh, the county council's fault. Indeed, it was the school board that took a very aggressive position but a lawsuit was avoided and an accommodation was, we, was reached. We did reduce school spending this year below the amount requested by the school board and the amount requested by the county executive, and we still have first-rate, world-class schools. Thank you. Mr. Narayanan. The perception that I have is exactly what uh, George Leventhal mentioned, and he has been within the government so he knows better that you can simply have the council has the power to allocate the money, but how the, uh, the school system decides to spend it or find savings is not in the control. So the only way to bring in control is to uh, tell the school system that, listen, this is the part of money that's, uh, that is there to work with, find the savings. Thank you. Ms. Florine. As Councilmember Leventhal has stated, uh, that all the county council can do is appropriate the dollars, and we do it by categories. It is the school board of education that determines how those dollars are actually spent. Uh, the challenge of this year and of the future is, is community expectations. We've already started work on next year's budget. Uh, our fiscal plan has been shared. We've sh I've shared it with our um, agency leaders, uh, so they see what the projections are and they can plan accordingly. I'm very optimistic that this will avoid some of the, uh, the bumps in the road we had this year. Thank you. Mr. Evans. You know, citizens, it's irrelevant what almost what I think about this. I do believe that the county council has control over the funding of the school system's budget, but I think what's important is what do you believe? and how do we seek your input in an effective way about how we curtail costs in that agency that's about 57 percent of the budget. I worked in it for 30 years. I know a little bit about it, and I believe that there are some efficiencies that can come about, and we can use our bully pulpit to make those changes occur. Thank you. Mr. Reamer. Well, the council funds the budget, and the historic uh, perspective has seemed to be a fairly hands-off role. Uh, I don't think that's going to do anymore, 
And we're going to have to take a step forward now in our relationship with the school board and with MCPS and the county executive to figure out how to save money in the school system without having cuts showing up in the classroom, without having disagreements devolving into lawsuits and high wire acts. Um, that is going to take a very strong collaborative approach. Uh, and It has to be part of the, the basic mentality of government in the county. Thank you. Mr. Elrich. The real problem is what we're not talking about here, which is the state's maintenance of effort, which requires the school system basically to spend more every year adjusted for inflation and increases in the student population size. Translate it this way. If the school board came back with a budget that was below what the state says your maintenance of effort is, they would get additional penalties. If they saved $50 million in genuine savings, the state could take away this year another $89 million. It makes it very hard to work with them when they view any cuts they propose as leading to cuts that they didn't propose. We need a more collaborative relationship. We need to change the state law there. Thank you. Ms. Trachtenberg. Well, we know this year there will be discussions about the school budget, no doubt, but we'll need to have those discussions on maintenance of effort, as Councilmember Elridge has indicated. And beyond that is looming the big conversation on teacher pension uh, benefits. We have some extraordinary problems that we face around school funding. There is no question about that. That's going to require a strategy with our state delegation and most importantly, more collaboration, not only with the school board, but with the MCPS leadership, as well as with the superintendent. And certainly the public has a right to participate in that dialogue as well. Thank you. Ms. DeWinter. Well, as president of the Montgomery County Council of PTAs, I did sit in and participate in the budget development process of the school system, so I have quite extensive knowledge of the school's budget and their processes. And I do think that there are a number of changes in the timeline and the process that the, that the Board of Education could take to improve the oversight that it has over the budget and the budget development. Uh, and I do believe that some level of council oversight is appropriate to make sure that the school system is fulfilling or serving the needs in, an, in one of the things that I'm interested in asking about is what are they going to do about the declining graduation rate of minority students. Thank you. Ms. Wagner. I'd like to see a stronger relationship between the county executive and the county council and the school board. I would like us to be able to count on the school board to have a more muscular approach to the budgeting process. The difficulty we have with this maintenance of effort is that we have to find a way to get it uncoupled. Our delegation has to go right to work on that and do it quickly. The real problem is we can't even, we can't even fund something more because it's working, because we're not allowed to ask that question. I think that we can find a way to do this one better. Thank you so much. And now it's time for us to turn to the uh, closing statements. Closing statements will be 90 seconds each. And um, let's see. And why don't we we'll go back to alphabetical order? Why don't we start with Jane DeWinter, please? As I said in the beginning, when I started thinking about running for office, I believed that with the years of service to the community, and with the skills and knowledge that I have as an economist, as an instructor of economics, a researcher, and that the knowledge that I had of the school system, that I brought some unique skills and approach to tackling the problems that the county has. We have a council that is facing tough times, has come through four years where there have been obvious problems in terms of people working together, and I believe that it's time for a change. And if you think, as I do, that it is time for a change, then I ask you to consider the three things that I bring to the table. One is leadership. I've served as the leader of the largest child advocacy organization in the county and made significant changes in the school system and, and budgeting and advocated for priorities that are in place today and changes that are in place today. 
knowledge. I have a very deep and broad knowledge of the county through my work and on this and my service on the Commission on Children and Youth. I know the county very well. I have met with people all across the county for years. And this is one of the things that I think is important is that knowledge of what are the particular issues in different communities. And I also bring commitment. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Elrich. I'd, I'd welcome your support on September 14th to come back to the council for a second term. Um, I've been endorsed by an interesting group of people. I have Martin O'Malley's endorsement. I have Peter Franchot's endorsement. I have Doug Gensler's endorsement. I have Ike Leggett's endorsement. I'm supported by most of the state delegates and most of the state senators from Montgomery County. I was endorsed by an interesting group of organizations. I have the Bethesda Chevy Chase Chamber of Commerce, which most of you would never have thought I would have gotten. And I have the, um, the, the Greater Capital Area Association of Realtors. But I also have the Sierra Club. I have Progressive Maryland. I have Progressive Neighbors. I have um, the Teachers Union. And I have the Washington Post, which referred to me as one of the most constructive members of this council. I want to come back because I'm a progressive, I'm an activist, and I'm an environmentalist. I've worked with many of you in this audience for many, many years. I'm somebody you know that you can come into and get a meeting with. I'm someone that you can come and talk to and know that you're going to be heard. And there's nothing more important for the citizens of this county than to know that if you walk in the door of a council member, not just that we're giving you the time, because a lot of us will give you the time, but I'm not just giving you the time, I'm listening and I'm willing to work with you. And when you bring issues in front of me and I have to work with different parties, I will try to bring about resolutions that address all of the concerns of the people involved. I view that as my responsibility as a council member. I like representing you. I like being a part of the Montgomery County Council. I hope you like the job I've done and I hope you'll vote for me on September 14th. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Evans. Thank you. It's been a real pleasure to meet here this evening with you and express some of my ideas and thoughts. And what I would like to leave you with is that I believe I bring three skills to serve as a county council member. First of all, the skill of listening. I believe I'm a good listener. I believe that in my experience as a school system administrator and teacher, as a uh, representative of the nominating committee for the Board of Trustees of Montgomery College for the, my vice presidency on the Mental Health Association. I've gotten out to know this county very well, and I have the skills to listen and to provide services to people. Secondly, I think I'm a learner. Once I get information and, and learn it, I then use it and try to apply it to situations. And then finally, I believe I can lead. I believe that our council right now needs leadership. In spite of the collaboration that has been announced here by the incumbents, there has been a great de deal of divisiveness that's occurred in the prior three years, and I think I bring the skills to stop that divis divisiveness so that we can work together. And most importantly, I want to hear from you. I want to hear from the citizens, and I just don't mean town forums. I mean really hear from you, talk with you on a regular basis to hear what you have to say, what you think, and what you feel. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Florine. Thank you. I want to thank the, our audience tonight uh, for caring for your so, so many contributions to our community and for your support in the past. I'm Nancy Florine. I ask for your support on September 14th. And I thank you uh, for how you've helped me uh, serve you. I've spent nearly 30 years in this community listening, working with you, trying to solve problems. I'm committed. I'm working for you. These are not easy issues that we face. I think you want people of character, of commitment, and community. This is what Montgomery County is all about. I think our core values of service to the public, the ones I've demonstrated over the many years, I've got a track record. And I'd like to think that you feel that I've served you well, or at least tried to. 
I've worked with you, and I think I forged a plan for the future with you between our, the work we've done in the community and the master plan work and the work we've done amongst ourselves in planning a fiscal future. Uh, we have a bright future in Montgomery County. I'd be privileged and honored to be able to participate in that because I think together we can make this a great community and we will do that. Thank you very much. I request your uh, vote on September 14th. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Leventhal. We have several good Democrats up here who are seeking your support and I'm glad that we have the opportunity to make our case. I hope that you will hold all of us accountable for the promises that we've made, but also look at the track record that we've accomplished. It's not just a matter of saying things that sound good to different audiences, it's also a question of how have you used the responsibility that you've had to help people and make a difference. Earlier this summer I attended the opening, the ribbon cutting of Aunt Hattie's Place, which is a facility that will serve foster teenage boys who have grown out of being adoptable by foster parents. This is going to provide a stable foundation for these boys' future lives because of the caring and dedication of the nonprofit operator, Aunt Hattie. I've put a lot of time and effort into bringing this project to fruition. And when you stand in front of something like this and you know that it's going to help people's lives every day, you understand the power that an at-large council member has. And so I'm flattered that distinguished community leaders like these seek the office. I understand why they want the office. It's not about us as individuals. It's about helping people. It's about creating a stable foundation from which people are able to achieve and achieve the bright future for Montgomery County that this county deserves. So I'm honored to serve. I get to help people every day. I do want another four years to continue helping people, but I know we had to cast some tough votes. We cut spending by a billion dollars below projected levels. And yes, we raised taxes by a couple of hundred million dollars too. I knew when I raised my hand that I might lose my seat, and other council members knew it as well, but I think we made the right decisions. We balanced the budget, we preserved our AAA bond rating, and Montgomery County is still well managed and we continue to have good government. Thank you so much. Mr. Narayanan, please. The Montgomery County Council is a team, and the effectiveness of a team come from, comes from the competency of all the team members together. At this point in time, if you look at the people who are in the County Council and the candidates over here, you'll find many of them come from activist background, from the legal side, from uh, uh, political circles, but there is nobody over here who has the experience of a management consultant and an economist put together, although we have one economist right over here too. The, to have this right composition at this time, we are at a period where we need to seriously cut costs without cutting services. I have done this for my condominium association over the last three years. Three years ago, my condominium association was in the same place as where the county is. Only thing is the county is 800 times larger than my condominium association. And, but the thing is, that's not the only place where I have worked. I have done the same thing for Coca-Cola, for Microsoft, for ITT Hartford, number of Fortune 500 companies that I have worked with as a consultant over the last two decades. I would like to bring this as a service to the community. It's up to you. If you would like to vote for me on uh, uh, September 14th or before, it's not for me alone, but for all of you, and I trust you will choose to find the right team for yourself. Thank you very much, and vote on September 14th. Thank you. Um, Ms. Trachtenberg. I'm sorry. Did you Reamer. want to go alphabetically? Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Uh, Mr. Reamer, I apologize. Well, thank you for being here. I ask for your vote. I'm running for the at-large uh, on the county council. And I'm not asking you to vote against any of our incumbents today. I think they all have distinguished records. I'm asking for you to vote for me because I think I bring something a little different to the table. I think my work organizing coalitions uh, bringing people together, whether that's to fight Bush on Social Security, to get young people involved in the Obama campaign. I think it's a little different. My perspective of a younger family and the county services that we are looking at 
it's a little different. And I think we need to mix things up. When I kicked off my campaign in February, uh, Senator Jamie Raskin said, we need to change the chemistry. Um, I think we have a good council. I think we can make it better. I think we need to mix it up a little bit. We are going through an economic crisis, and it is playing out at every level here in Montgomery County. I think we need the next four years to be better than the last four. So I ask for your vote. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Trachtenberg, try it again. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you uh, for being here this evening. I think the defining question that you have to ask yourself before September 14th is do you want to take a leap of faith and vote into office someone who really has no experience in government oversight or debt management, or do you want to put your trust once again in a seasoned and accomplished legislator, me, who's been willing to make hard choices. I've stood up to the unions. I've got the bruises to show it. I've been willing to hard have hard conversations, make hard decisions, despite the political consequences. And people have noticed this. The Washington Post endorsed me. They said they were doing it because I deserved election, because of my strength of character, but also because of my courage around those hard decisions. Phil Andrews, the council member from District 3, has endorsed me. He said I was the council fiscal watchdog as well as the hardest working council member. Back a few weeks ago when I announced my reelection bid, our county executive Ike Leggett said that this is not the time for on the job training. You need the best and the brightest, the experienced people who are willing to make the hard choices. Things are going to be that difficult. We can't take the risk. We need to have people there who are proven leaders. I hope you agree. Please vote for me, Dutchie Trachtenberg, for Montgomery County Council at large on September 14th. Thank you, and Ms. Wagner. My name is Becky Wagner. I'm asking for your vote on September 14th for County Council at large. I am a proven, trusted leader when Senator Paul Sarbanes endorsed me, he said that I would lead with intelligence and integrity. And he urged county citizens to make sure that I had the opportunity to do that. I'm a proven trusted leader who's a coalition builder. I have led the Safety Net Coalition, the Vote No on Ficker Amendments Coalition, Stop Slots Coalition. I have been able to bring people together at a table who would cross the street rather than greet each other. It's about time we start to bring that skill set back to the table and back to the county council. The teachers know I'm a proven trusted leader, the firefighters, the chamber. Everyone has said, come on, can't we do this just a little bit better? We have the responsibility to model civility, and I'm urging you to make a choice for me on September 14th. Becky Wagner, at large. Thank you. Thank you. Candidates, you've done a great job. I really appreciate the fact that you adhered to our clock. And I now would like to wrap this up and say thank you uh, to our sponsors. Again, the Montgomery College Alumni Association, the Montgomery County Civic Federation, the League of Women Voters of Montgomery County, and the Organization of Chinese American, uh, Americans Greater DC Chapter. I thank you for that. I want to thank our audience for taking the time to come out and learn about these candidates. They are working very hard to get uh, your attention to win election, and they will determine the future of our county. And I appreciate your taking the effort to be informed voters, and I would certainly say to all of you um, out there watching by television, again, thank you for taking the time to learn and be good citizens uh, and watch uh, the answers that these uh, candidates are giving. So, again. Thank you all very much. Let's have a big hand for our candidates. And that concludes our program.